Natasha Wariku. I'm on the faculty at the Graduate School of Education here at Harvard. Um, and I'm going to um, introduce our last panel, which is on the children of immigrants. And I'll be the moderator. And I think it's appropriate that this is our last panel because the story, the, really the future of gender and migration is, is going to be about um, gender and migration and the children of immigrants. So with that, I'll introduce our first speaker, um, uh, Roberto Gonzalez, who is um, currently at the University of Chicago and is about to join the faculty at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, which we're thrilled about. Um, so I want to thank to uh, give thanks to Dean Cohen and Mary Waters for organizing this this fantastic conference and, and for inviting me. Um, it's it's really great to be here and and thank you all for for staying into the afternoon. This is really impressive on a beautiful Friday afternoon. Um, so what I want to do is um, draw a smaller circle and talk about a, a segment of this larger population of children of immigrants. Um, and I want to focus on uh, a project that I'm wrapping up, a 10-year project that I'm wrapping up now, um, doing some follow-up interviews. I'm about 75% done with a book, um, a study in Los Angeles that started in 2002, um, 2002 into 2003, um, looking at the broad question what ha happens to undocumented immigrant youth as they make critical transitions through adolescence and adulthood. So I've interviewed 150 young adults, and I've, for most of them, I've, I've followed for this, this entire time. A um, couple things about, about this sample. Um, it's roughly equal uh, in terms of gen gender, in terms of number of men and women in the study and roughly equal in terms of educational attainment. About half of the sample um, has moved through um, college and graduate school, um, kind of high achievers. I, um, I think we commonly call them dreamers. Um, and the other half exited at or before high school graduation. Um, so these young people, um, it's been said that they're that, that children in general, in general are invisible victims of our immigration policies. Um, and undocumented youth really, I mean, in, in, in very profound ways, as was uh, mentioned earlier this morning, represent unintended consequences of our immigration policy. Um, uh, more specifically, our border policy. And so what I mean by that is that um, for generations, um, migrants from the South, largely Mexico, came to the U.S. We're, we're talking about more than a hundred year history of labor migration, uh, Mexicans into the United States. Um, but for, for generations, m Mexican migrants worked in the United States, left their families of origin, families in their countries of origin, um, worked seasonally in the United States three, four months at a time, and went back, right? And would repeat this process back and forth. Um, again, leaving families in their country of origin. Starting in the late 1980s, we began to invest a lot more money on our southern border. Um, a longer, taller, and thicker fence, um, increased number of agents on the border, Right, and increased surveillance technology. We're now talking about drones at our southern border. Right? As a result, it became a lot more costly, a lot more difficult, and a lot more dangerous to cross. And so rather than going back and forth then, is that migrants sent for their families. So labor demand didn't stop until around 2008. So we have for, for a number of years, right? Um, and if we, if we think about the the late 1980s when the undocumented population was a little under two million people after the legalization, um, to 2006, at the height of the, the, the undocumented population, 12.1 million, right? so a population that, that grew. Um, and so what we have for the first time in large numbers right, are children without legal status that would grow up in the United States. 
So it's important to know, we, we talk a lot about this 11 million number. So it's really important to note that those who come as children make up almost 19% of that 11 million number. Um, I think people often mistakenly say and refer to this 11 million as 11 million undocumented workers. It's not tr that's not entirely true at all. Right? So here's the dilemma. 1982 in the Supreme Court, um, in Plyler versus Doe, the, the court ruled that states could not deny undocumented children K through 12 education. Right? Um, as a result, undocumented children are integrated um, into the legal framework of this country through the participation in K through 12 schools. Right? Plyler's reach was very limited, however, in that Plyler didn't extend beyond K through 12, and Plyler didn't extend beyond schools. So while undocumented children can go to school legal, legally, right, they can't work, they can't drive in most states, they can't vote, they can't get financial aid for college, and can be deported at any time. So tens of thousands of these young people leave schools every year, but they leave to uncertain futures. Right? Our laws treat children and adults differently, but don't account for the continuity right, of children becoming adults. So these young people, as members of um, what Ruben Rambaut refers to as the 1.5 generation, right, is that they straddle the, 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 the adult migrants and the American-born second generation, right, as members of this 1.5 generation, face the dual task of acculturating right, and making these critical transitions through uh, childhood to adolescence and, and young adulthood. So for these young people, and I, so think about these young people compared to their parents, right? Is that because of their legal integration in the public school system, from day one in this country, they're integrated into our legal framework, right? Their parents, by contrast, right, are absorbed into low-wage labor markets, right? They, they, from day one, um, learn how to survive as undocumented immigrants. And to borrow a cliche, they, they live in the shadows. By contrast, their children grow up in the sunshine. Right? They grow up to Barney and the Power Rangers. They date, they go to the prom, they accumulate all of these Americanizing experiences. Each year in the United States takes them further and further away from the realities of their parents. They speak less of their parents' language, they watch more TV, their, their culture becomes a hybrid culture. Paradoxically, though, each year living in the United States brings them closer and closer to the reality of their parents. And so what we see is that for these young people, growing up entails a chaotic shift. So as undocumented children make these critical transitions that I'm talking about into adolescence and young adulthood, they move from spaces of belonging to exclusion. From, from belonging to rejection, from inclusion to exclusion, from a de facto legal to illegal in the pejorative. And I want to talk a little bit more um, in a couple of minutes about my use, of, my use of the I word, because it is intentional. But what I want to do first is to go to some of the quotes of the young people that I've, 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 I've been talking to for these, this last 10 years. And here's Rodolfo first, describing this kind of awakening that he has. And, and we often talk about, we, we conjure up these dream metaphors, right? Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream, the Dream Act, um, even Langston Hughes' Dream Deferred. Very poignantly, Rudy, as his friends call him, likened this experience, turned it on its head, right? Likened this experience to waking up to a nightmare. So he says, well, you know what? I never actually felt like I wasn't born here. Because when I came here, I was like 10 and a half. I went to school, I learned the language. But I first felt like I was really out of place when I, tried to, when I graduated from high school, when I tried to get a job. So I asked, why was that? He said, because I didn't have a social security number. Well, I didn't even know. I mean, I didn't even know what that was. You know, 
Social Security, legal, illegal. I didn't even know what that was. I asked my mom, and she says it's in the process. In the process? I didn't even know what that meant. I don't know why she would tell us that. So for many like, like Rudy, and I I've talked to over the years, dozens if not hundreds of these young people who've had very similar experiences, right? That le because legality was not a requirement for most aspects of childhood, at around 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, for many of these people, right, as friends are moving forward, as friends are getting first jobs, as friends are getting driver's licenses, as friends are going on to college, as friends are starting careers, as friends are meeting each other for drinks after work, many of these young people are forced to stay in one place, right? Um, and so for these young people, this, this awakening um, is profound, and many like Rudy reported not knowing about their status until much later on. A good number of these young people told me that they, they were aware that they were undocumented, right? But for these young people, being undocumented didn't become salient until matched up with experiences of exclusion, right? And that's the key here. And so, he, so here's Rudy again. Um, he says, but when I actually wanted to get a job, I couldn't. I couldn't because I didn't have that social security number. So my first job was cleaning carpets, helping out my dad. And so Rudy and others like him, they look at their parents and they see themselves and say, well, I've got levels of education that far surpass those of my parents. Um, I can speak English with a, mu with a much greater fluency, but here I am with the same narrowly circumscribed range of options, right? Similarly, here's Sergio. And Sergio told me about this 1957 dream car that he wanted, that a retired postal, community, postal carrier in his community had, and he begged this, this gentleman, he really wanted to buy this car. And so the, the man finally caved and said, look, if you come up with half of a down payment, uh, half of the, the $5,000 for a down, down payment, um, then we can talk. So he saved up his money, paper routes, and small part-time jobs, weekend jobs. And so here he is, he fi he's finally old enough, he goes to the DMV, and he's told that he needs his social security number. He's dev devastated, so he's telling me about this. He says, that really sucked. I had been all like to his friends, I'm gonna get my car, car before all of you, right? But I couldn't, it was unfair, and I had to, you know, what could I do? How could I tell them that I can't, that I can't drive? It really messed me up. So in his very colloquial language, right, like that really sucked, really messed me up, these terms very, very powerfully in their simplicity, right, capture the essence and the frustration of these blocked opportunities. So, so I mentioned that, that many of these young people don't have an awareness of their status um, or, or, or really don't have a full awareness of what the status means until much later on. So many of these young people are not certainly talking with their friends as children about being undocumented and what that means, right? And so this transition also entails moving into a highly charged, highly stigmatized status, that of the undocumented immigrant, right? And so for many of the young people that I talk to, stigma operates as a secondary border that reinforces legal exclusions. And so here's Grace. She says, I just stopped going out. I was tired of asking for a ride and coming up with excuses. And every time it was a hassle with my friends. They wouldn't let it go. They just wouldn't let it go. So I started telling them I was too busy with school. But after a while, they stopped inviting me. I end up spending a lot of weekends by myself because most of my friends don't call me anymore. And it's affected everything with people I meet. It's affected the way I, why, the way I am when I meet new people. I used to be very outgoing, but now I try to get my, keep my guard up. I try not to get too close to people. So what I want to point out, what I call this transition to illegality, right, is that, that and so here I'm, my use of the I word, and, and there have been a lot of campaigns drop the I word, right? Why, why in the world are you using this I word? What, what I want to draw attention to really is the ways in which our laws narrowly circumscribe people's everyday lives and their, and, and, and their subsequent choices. Right? 
So I want to move quickly through the, the gendered aspect of this program, of, this, of, this, of my talk. Um, and, and so laws narrowly, laws and circumstance, circumstances also narrowly circumscribe families' options, right? And the, the options through which families make decisions, right? And those are often, oftentimes gendered. And you, you see here um, what happens in a lot of families, and, and, and these are some themes that emerge, and, and this is certainly not everyone in my study, but for a lot, in a lot of families, Right, is that a lot of the young men, as soon as they turned 14, 15, 16, went out to work. Right? Parents are working in, in many cases. We're talking about Los Angeles, where uh, there's a very high cost of living right, and meager wages. And so in order to make ends meet, everybody in the household is needed to do something. So many of the boys went out to work. And oftentimes, girls were left with the responsibility of taking care of young, younger siblings right, and doing a lot of the housework. And it really, fundamentally, for many of them, shaped their, their schooling patterns. And very ironically, and I uh, draw upon the work of a, a colleague of mine, Rosie Tafoya Estrada, who's at Boise State, who, um, who has noticed this pattern, and she calls it the unintended consequences of patriarchy. That a lot of the young women who are at home right, end up spending a lot more time not out in the street with their friends, but once their work was done, concentrating on homework and moving then through college. These also shape working patterns. And, and my last two examples, Dora and Sergio, back to Sergio, is that, that Dora, and I'll let you read the, 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 the quotes on the slides, uh, but Dora, when I met Dora, Dora was eight months pregnant. And she had been looking for a job for almost six months. She had given up because, because it was now too late for her, her to find a job. She was 26 years old. Prior to that, she had only worked one full-time job in her life. She was able to because her parents didn't ask her to work. And when she married, her husband didn't, also didn't ask her to work, didn't want her to work. Right? And so she didn't have a lot of, 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 of human capital. Sergio, on the other hand, um, resisted work resisted driving for the longest time until he, um, he met this young woman that he fell in love with. They, they ended up having a kid. So he thought the responsible thing to do would be to, to take a job. So Sergio took a job um, at a factory and got a ride home with a coworker um, in Santa Ana, California, um, where Santa Ana Unified School District is 92% Latino. And on any given day, there's a lot of police activity in Santa Ana. So something about the driver and Sergio and their clean-shaven head signaled something to the police officers. Police officers pulled them over. In the coworker's car, they found um, a small amount of marijuana, but they also found a pipe bomb. And so under the Patriot Act, not, Patriot Act, not only Sergio, not only the driver, but also Sergio, right, they were both prosecuted, and Sergio served three years, right, three years in prison, and then was deported. The vast majority, we see the vast majority of deportations, overwhelming majority, are to men. We really see the ways in which some of these gender patterns get shaped. And so finally, really, really finally, is that undocumented status really clearly emerges as a master status. And so I mentioned the college goers in my sample. Um, now upwards of 30 plus have finished college and, and, and about 15 more have gone on to graduate programs. Before the deferred action last summer, not one of them was in a, um, in a career path that matched her or his educational credentials. Um, instead, many of them found themselves um, in restaurants, um, cleaning offices, working in factories. And I want to end with this quote by Esperanza, and for Spanish speakers in the group, the pseudonym I've given her is not without irony, Esperanza meaning hope. But here's Esperanza three years out of college talking about her experiences working in factories and, and, and restaurants. She says, the people working at those places, like the cooks and the cashiers, they're all really young and I feel really old. Like what am I doing here if they're all like 16, 17, 
um, years old. The others, she calls them senoras at 35, <laughs> they dropped out of school, but because they have little kids, they're still working in the restaurant. And thinking about that, it makes me feel so stupid. And in the factories, too, they ask me, ¿Qué estás haciendo aquí? What are you doing here? You can speak English. You graduated from high school. You can work anywhere, right? For Esperanza, her biggest achievement to date, her college graduation, that makes her parents the most proud, right? For most of these jobs that she's eligible for, she leaves that out, right? Because she doesn't believe she'll get the job if she tells them she's a college graduate. My wife teases me that I, I talk a lot and I talk very slowly. I'm, I'm sure I ran way over time, but thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am very happy to be here, and I am very grateful to Mary Waters, and I'll tell you in a minute what Mary did for me several years ago. So I'm very grateful to Mary Waters and also to Dean Cohen. Okay, and I'm also grateful that the conference organizers chose to include the Haitian immigrants in that discussion. And of course, the Haitian, yes, yes. <laughs> and Haitian immigrants, they constitute a sizable portion of the black diasporic um, communities in the US. So I'm very happy that uh, you guys chose to include that as well. Okay, um, in my research with second generation Asian immigrants in the United States, I ask to what extent the strong sense of membership in a separate ethnic group so prevalent among first generation Asian immigrants will be carried out in the second. Will Haitian families be successful at passing on to their offspring the same ethnic feelings, identification cultures and values? How do their children choose to define themselves? Is ethnic identity important to their self-image? What role do the home and the external environment play in shaping Haitian youth in identity? Those are among the central questions that I set out to investigate. My investigation revealed and explained multiple patterns in ethnic identification among, among second generation Haitian immigrants. An analysis of the second generation Haitian immigrant experience in the United States shows how identity formation for this particular group is indeed a very complex process, riddled with pride and prejudice, peer and, interner and intergenerational conflicts, successes, and failures. As they come of age, and as they struggle to forge a comfortable identity for themselves in American society and become somebody, Asian youth choose various ethnic paths and devise many strategies of adaptation and integration. Those are shaped by both the external context that surround them, that is the American realities, and the home environment where they are reared. In many ways, those two, set of, of those two sets of norms, those of the surrounding milieu and those of the family and ethnic community, interact, compete, and too often clash with one another to produce multiple trends in ethnic identification. Haitian youth undoubtedly exhibit a very distinct form of adaptation as opposed to a relatively uniform path of integration, and they illustrate the complex and multi-directional process of segmented assimilation, a word that you would recognize, Professor Port, uh, Rombo, that's your word, okay? And uh, I'm going to show what I mean by the... Okay, this morning, Sonia was talking about crossing borders by train. When it comes to Haitian immigrants, they do not cross borders. They cross waters. And they cross waters on a rickety boat. Um, and sometimes that boat doesn't make it on the Florida shore. And you have in that second slide here, uh, Haitian um, trying to cross by boat, the boat run aground, and the immigration service police officers, they line them up and they were going to be taken to detention centers, the Crum 
Chrome Detention Facility in Florida before they even can apply for asylum or anything else. And then many demonstrations followed that. Now this slide is very hard. Those of you who are lawyers in the room may remember in 1997 the most egregious case against Haitian immigrants that was the Abner Louima case who was brutally beaten and sodomized by the police uh, in Brooklyn as he was coming out as a restaurant, okay? Uh, Luima was defended pro bono by Johnny Cochran. Most of you would remember the late Johnny Cochran. And, he, and Johnny Cochran won that judgment for Albert Luima, and that was the case where the police, the New York City had to pay the highest level of money. Okay, so that tells you the climate of reception has not been all the time very favorable to Haitian immigrants. And if you are a Haitian immigrant, a youth growing up at that time, you probably would not want to say that you are, that you are Haitian. Okay. Unlike the parents who want to remain Haitian and cannot see themselves becoming American, or more precisely, black American, second generation Haitian immigrants are not so categorical. Because many of them were born in the United States or came at a very early age, the 2.0 or the 1.5 in particular, to use categories well established by sociologists of immigration, they identify themselves more readily with American symbols that they find difficult to discard altogether just to please their parents. Even the Haitian born and raised um, who are born in Haiti and raised there, who have more familiarity with the American uh, context, many of them find more parameters appealing in American society. Now, on the other hand, Haitian youth who are raised in middle class families who possess more resources are better able to provide for their children and can protect them from the hostility and unfairness of the outside world, which tend to show a bit more tolerance for the more fortunate. Consequently, those are adolescent coming from middle class family millers are more ready to accept their Haitian heritage and do not reject, at least not overtly, the teaching of their parent who constantly stress the value of hard work, a good education, solid moral principle, and the benefits of Haitian tradition. After all, when they look at, their relative, at, the, at the relative success of their parents, characterized by middle class occupation, home ownership, and a certain degree of material comfort, and the success that the parent themselves attribute to their good Haitian character, these children indeed have nothing to be ashamed of. Their familial social capital is strong enough to insulate them to a certain extent from the negative opinion that society at large tend to harbor toward third world immigrants, including Haitian. And here let me show you some examples. Uh, and I chose Boston, Boston owns Haitian immigrants. One is Marie Saint Fleur. And I am sure most of you would have heard of who Marie Saint Fleur is. She was a state representative representing the Suffolk District. And currently, she is in Mayor Thomas Menino's cabinet as chief of advocacy and strategic investment. She ran from office with uh, Riley when he was trying to get the governorship and uh, did not make it. Okay, another person, and I chose example, successful Asian American from middle class family, I choose Boston example. Many of you might know who Linda Dawson Afori is, and her husband, you know, has been a journalist. They own, I believe, multiple newspapers. One of them is the Boston Haitian Reporter, and I used to write for them. Okay, and again, she's been very, very successful. So that's example of uh, middle class Haitian families who have been able to instill those values in their children. Now, on the other hand, the Haitian youth who are raised 
in families from lower socioeconomic status experience much more intensely the coldness and the brutality of the outside world. Further, they feel very insecure about their identity and their future in general, as they are unable to find in their homes some of the material comfort and financial stability to which they vigorously aspire and the obtaining of which presumably can be attributed to some Haitian traits. On the contrary, they tend to associate their deprivation with their, home, their Haitian condition and relentlessly endeavor to find a way out of this miserable situation. For many Haitian immigrant youth who, because of their lack of any resources, belong to the Haitian and black underclass, a Haitian identity constitutes an impediment to social mobility. And again, I'm talking about the lower socioeconomic uh, group. Because um, that Haitian identity carries the burden of a painful past. It is for them an undeserved characteristic that can only reinforce their multiple marginalities. Their attempt to eradicate this unpleasant feature began with the development of feeling of shame toward their parents and their ethnic community, and it accompanied them by the total, and it is accompanied by the total rejection of their teaching and way of life. Parents preaching about the value of hard work, honesty, education, and respect for adults and authority figures fall on deaf ears because these youth do not see the tangible reward of such qualities, certainly not in their parents. In their opinions, their parents have not been able to improve their conditions since their relocation to the United States, and they can barely meet their most basic need for shelter, food, and clothing. Moreover, those same teenagers also discover the disdain that American society at large harbors toward those at the very bottom of the totem pole. Job, um, job opportunities are blocked since it is a documented fact that many employers sometimes use addresses as a way of screening potential applicants. And again, if you live you know, in some neighborhood in Brooklyn, some people, employers, would not want to be bothered with you. Individuals residing in location considered bad are automatically judged as being bad, so the location describes the character of a person because characteristics characteristic given to neighborhoods are extended to human beings as well. In consequence, the most unfortunate members of one society, of our society, are unwelcome in the workplace and are, deni and are denied jobs, thus perpetrating the cycle of poverty. This situation also causes those adolescents to become very attracted and vulnerable to the street culture as it promises through the use of drugs, violence, and membership in gangs, an easier life and quick access to material commodities. Getting immediate gratification by every means necessary is their motto. And, they, and those who teach this particular message also become their mentors. Needless to say, in this context, parents stagnating in destitution cannot compete with the attraction of the streets. Considered in its entirety, the Haitian immigrant community continues to face tremendous challenges, the greatest one being the future of the second generation. Given the American realities of racism, ethnic intolerance, and decrease in the amount of social services, and now more than ever in this climate, no one can say for sure what life will no one can say for sure that life will become easier with each succeeding generation. In some cases, downward mobility may, likely, may, may be the likely outcome of the immigrant experience. Only through the successes of, of the second generation can one easily ass assess the extent to which Haitians' lives are uplisted and restored and the extent to which they are, as members of any group, really capable of the many achievements that enhance the human conditions. 
And I'm going to end on more successful Asian American. The young folks in this room most definitely would know who that person is. And White Clef Jean, ironically enough, ran for the presidency of Haiti. So the, another topic is the involvement of Haitian American, even the successful second generation in what's going on back home in Haiti, certainly uh, post-earthquake. This person, I think most of you would know who she is. It is successful Asian American writer, Edwidge Dantica. Uh, she is the winner of the 2009 MacArthur Genius Grant. This is an example that's a success story. She was born in Haiti, emigrated, I think she was 11 or 12, and she was children left behind when the parents came to make a better life for themselves, but that's a success story. And I'll end, of course, with my very own friend, Michelle de Graff, associate professor at MIT. And Michelle is not here with us because he's in Haiti right now. And Michelle, some of you, you know, who work with people at MIT, know is the, is the recipient of $1 million NSF grant to develop technology for the teaching of science and math in, the, in schools in Haiti. And again, showing the impact of the successful second generation back home in Haiti. And this slide here, you know Chomsky, of course, who doesn't know him, and that's the prime minister of Haiti who was invited to come and talk to the team of researchers at MIT when uh, you know, they're developing those technology-oriented uh, method of teaching STEM discipline in Haiti. And I'll leave with this. This is, again, uh, Michelle de Graff teaching technology to school children in Haiti, an example of the success and how, again, second generation, they want to give something back to Haiti, and they use whatever uh, influence they have in education, in arts and whatnot, to help the conditions of those underprivileged in Haiti. Hi. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, this is a very different conference than the one I'm used to. Um, I think the solo economist is speaking today. And although it is late, this is the last talk of the last uh, panel, I'm going to ask you to uh, cross borders with me, not only methodologically in terms of, you know, we're going to go and talk about economics, sort of, but also that this is going to be a talk about methodology and let, only obliquely, I would say, about the second generation. So I'm going to beg your patience and uh, ask you to try to follow me to whatever extent uh, possible. Okay. Uh, you know, I was kind of filled a little bit with self-pity during lunchtime today. I was thinking, you know, Ruben had been talking eloquently about, you know, Sonia's talk being Velcro and full of stories, and his talk being Teflon. By the way, I thought it was Velcro, but his talk being Teflon because he was going to have some numbers. Well, and I was thinking, what is methodology? Okay, I mean, it's got to be, I don't know, I thought it was something sticky like oil, oil, you know. And, and so I'm, I'm done with the self-pity, but that's what I'm going to ask you to to deal with. OK. So um, this talk is about methodology because the way I came across to second generations is that I was interested in the issue of thinking about women and culture and the role of culture in defining women's role. And uh, I thought that we would see a lot of discussion about the diversity of outcomes for second generation. And we have in, in some of the talks today. We certainly have. But uh, uh, you know, maybe we could have uh, we could also look at this maybe more methodically and looked at differences in education and labor force participation, occupation, marital status, fertility, et cetera. And had we done that, I think one of the questions we would have liked to have asked is what role does culture play in producing these differences that we see across what people do and in particular across what women do. And the question I was interested in asking, is some of a question which a lot of you might think the answer is obvious. But as an economist, I don't think it is so obvious, which is, 
is the observed diversity that, that we see, is it all differences in economic circumstances, in initial family background, or parental education? Or does culture also play an, an important role? And if culture does play an important role, how does and why does it change over time? Don't worry, I don't plan to tackle all these questions. Okay, so I think the role of culture coming to gender now is especially important for thinking about variation in women's outcomes. It's not that it's not important for thinking about men. It's just that, especially when you think about the 20th century, it's been the huge century of change for women, okay? It's change in what women do. This change is pronounced across time, but it's also pronounced across space. And one, one might want to ask, and certainly what I was interested in asking, is what's the role of culture in this? So here I'm just gonna illustrate the points that I'm making. The reasons for this sample of countries may not be at first obvious, so not only I'm asking you to cross borders into economics, but I'm gonna take a historical view. This is going to be the people, the countries that are in my sample. Uh, and I'm going to be looking at a much earlier wave of uh, immigrants. I'm going to be talking to you about second generations in 1970. So we're talking about one, maybe two wave of immigrations earlier than it's been the, the focus of most of the talks, well, not the historians, uh, most of the talks today. Okay, so this is just to show you both across time and space, lots of difference, of course, in what women do. What is LFP? That's female labor force participation uh, across these countries, probably, you know, probably from age 14 to age, uh, I'll take a guess, 60. Uh, and you can see, you know, certainly upwards, but a lot of variation across countries at any point in time. Also a lot of variation than the number of children that people have. Less variation uh, in terms of, you see much clearer convergence over time, but still a lot of variation. That's a total fertility rate. That's a way of measuring how many kids a woman would be expected to have. And these are across these women's countries at these different decades, okay? These are averages within the country. The objective of today's talk is to try to explain how some economists are now thinking about culture and its role in economic outcomes. This is a traditionally taboo area in economics. It may be the bread and butter of sociologists and anthropologists. It's not the bread and butter of economics. And the reason for that is we economists like to be rigorous. And when we mean rigorous, we mean we want to be able to talk about how we can measure what we observe. So the, the, the reason that this was a taboo area in economics is that it was just too simple when you see differences across groups of people, say in the US, or across groups of people across space, say across countries, or across time to say, well, the reason that they're doing something different is because they have different preferences. They have different beliefs, i.e. they have different cultures. That's just too easy an explanation. There's nothing, that it's unobservable. How do we know it matters? So the challenge for economics as, uh, was to be able to find a rigorous way to talk about differences in cultures. So what I wanna do today is, and that's my little brief outline there, is to explain a little bit better why it's a challenge to talk rigorously about culture, uh, then to briefly talk to you about what an epidemiological approach to culture is, then to finally come to women from the second generation, then I'm gonna be looking at the US, and lastly to talk about some big questions, okay, which I'll just mention. So what's the challenge? Well, when you suppose that you're looking, you know, I showed you those slides of female labor force participation or fertility uh, across different countries and across time. You know, when you're looking, let's be concrete. Let's look at women across different countries. When you're looking at the difference in what women do, how, let's say how much they work outside the home, when, is the differences that you're observing due to economic and institutional environmental differences or do beliefs about what women should do, that is what women's role is, is that playing an important role? And the challenge that we face is that how do you sub separate cultural differences from differences in economic and institutional environments? So the way normally economists uh, approach these type of questions uh, would be we would try to run regressions. So regressions is just a way of uh, trying to organize data so that you have variation in 
something, say how much women work across countries, and you're trying to explain it with variation across other things, say uh, wages in different countries, taxes in different countries, um, the ability, the availability of childcare in different countries. You could try to explain it that way. But the list would be fairly infinite, and you would never be sure that you've put everything in your list. So at the end of the day, an economist would not really accept that what we call the residual, the part that you didn't name, the culture, is what was left over, and that that's what's explaining the variation. In other words, you can't just make a list of economic and institutional differences and hope to identify culture. Culture just can't be what's left over from your explanation. So that would be an economist's objection to that type of work. So what I thought about was to do something that epidemiologists do. So suppose an epidemiologist observes that there's differences in heart rate disease between Japanese men, or women, but let's, say, let's stick with men right now, Japanese men and American men, which there are. One question that they might want to ask is, well, is this due to genetic differences? Are Americans genetically different than Japanese, and that's what's giving the Japanese greater protection against heart disease? Or is it the result of the environment? The environment for an epidemiologist would be anything. It could be that the fact, you know, fish diet relative to a meat diet, exercise, etc. So how can you approach this question? Again, you can't just make lists of everything that's different between, say, Japan and the United States. What you do is you can look at immigrants to the United States that are from Japan and see if their heart rate disease has converged to the heart rate, the the, the same rate of disease as American men. Now, if you observe convergence in heart rate, in uh, heart disease <laughs> rates, then you're pretty sure it's not genetic. If you don't observe uh, 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 convergence, then you're not sure what it is. So it's not a very powerful test in one direction, it's a powerful test in the other direction. And you're not sure what it is because it could be that it could be genetics, but it could be that the Japanese are still eating fish even though they live in the United States and the Americans are not. Or they can live in particular parts of the country. Or maybe they get some uh, acquired uh, immunity from having lived a, a few years in Japan. So you're not really sure. So what I wanted to do is to uh, use this approach to think about studying culture and outcomes, uh, in particular economic outcomes. And I have a very broad view of what economic outcomes are. So again, the idea would be to think about what's the role of culture in determining differences in economic outcomes. Study immigrants. Now, again, what, what was the point of bringing the, looking at the Japanese in the United States? Well, now you were kind of holding fixed their environment. They were all living in the United States. Well, that's the same thing that you're doing when you're studying immigrants in the United States. Their economic and institutional environment is now the same. I realize that's a big stretch when we're talking about current immigration. It's less of a stretch when we're talking about 1970s. Their culture is different. So you have a different set of problems that now bias findings against culture. The behavior of immigrants may be differentially affected by shocks. They may not have the same language, initial wealth. There's assimilation, so beliefs are influenced by mainstream culture. So even if culture is very important in determining what women do across, say, different countries, it may not show up when you study them in the United States because they've been acculturated, they've been assimilated to uh, the norm in that country. And then there's selection. We've, we've learned a lot about how immigrants are not the average individual. Are they the average individual culturally? That would be a question you might, might want to ask. Part of a way around this problem is to study second generation immigrants. So second generation immigrants, second generation Americans are, are the ones that I'm studying. I'm going to be looking at a very particular group of people. I'm going to be looking at people who are from the second generation. That means their parents were born outside the United States. They're born in the United States. They're all married. They're all women. They're 30 to 40 years old. And it's 1970. So cross that border with me and pretend we're in 1970. And try to remember, for those of you who are old enough, what 1970 in the United States was, was like, OK? So women did work outside the house, but a good 50% of them probably did not work out the, outside the house. So we're talking about a different world. Now, there, of course, it, by studying second generation, you minimize the problem with shocks, of language differences, of selection, and unobserved economic factors are less important. 
important. The problem of cultural assimilation, of course, is worse because now you're looking at the children of immigrants. They've gone to school in the United States. You know, they probably speak uh, English better than they do their uh, family tongue. Uh, so there's a lot of other problems. And then the question can still arises, how are you going to measure culture? And the way that I'm going to measure culture when I'm going to look at a concrete question, so let's look at how much these women work outside the home. That's a question. Let's, let's define that as a question of interest. I'm going to cu proxy cultures with var variables that embody the beliefs. So in particular, I'm going to proxy their culture with the va past values of how much women used to work in their country of ancestry. So if I'm looking at women who are Italian-American, I'm going to be looking at how much women in Italy worked. And if I'm looking at you know, women who are coming from Czechoslovakia, I'm looking at how much those Czech women used to work. OK, why does that embody the relevant beliefs? Because that, that variable, how much women worked in those countries, embodies the economics of those countries, what wages were, for example, the institutions of those countries. Were you allowed to discriminate against women or not? You know, all sorts of things. Um, but it also embodies beliefs that be belong to that country. Now, if those variables can help us explain what second generation immigrant women, second generation American women are doing in the United States in 1970, it must be because the belief part is an important factor in explaining the variation across those countries. Otherwise, those variables should not be able to explain the variation in what women do in the United States. I hope that's clear. Uh, and if not, I apologize. <laughs> OK. So, um, OK. So here is just a scatter plot that shows you on the x-axis, the horizontal one, uh, the log, forget the log part, it doesn't really matter, 1950 female labor force participation. Why 1950? I just wanted to go back some decades. So here's how much women used to work on the x-axis across these different countries. On the y-axis, which is very interesting, it's how many hours women whose parents were born in, say, Mexico or Cuba or in the Philippines, how many hours they were working on average per week in the United States in 1970. They're 30 to 40 years old, they're married, they were born in the United States, and this is a variation in how much they work. So for those of you with a trained eye, you can see there's a positive relationship between these two variables. So this is just showing you a partial correlation. Still, nonetheless, it's interesting, it just shows you if women used to work more, say, uh, if in Denmark, then the descendants, then women, then the women uh, who are born to parents that come from Denmark and who live in the United States in 1970 work more than those that come, say, from Spain. Now, it's not enough to show you that correlation. And why? Because you should instantly be able to say to me, look, women's work behavior, their fertility behavior, it's not only affected by their culture, it's affected by differences in their economic backgrounds. So basically, really, you want to control for other factors, their education, spouse's age and education, their spouse's income, where they live. And so what, we, what I do in my work is, I, I want you to think about it figuratively, is I take two women. These women look the same in the sense that they live in the same city, so I'm sure they're not geographically different. They have the same education level. Their husbands look pretty much the same. In what sense? They have the same age, they have the same education, and they earn the same. They have the same household income. These women, therefore, differ basically only in their country of ancestry. And therefore, because they differ in their country of ancestry, they may be differing in their cultural beliefs. And so what I do is to show that even after controlling for all these things, the, uh, the cultural proxy, that is how much women used to work in their past in their country of ancestry, has explanatory value, large explanatory value, in, ex in, in power in explaining what they do today, today being 1970, in the United States. I am going to go through all of this and skip, and just to some big questions, so at least leave you something. So I, I'm afraid I wasn't able to show you very convincingly that actually uh, it might be very useful to think about uh, culture from an economics point of view. 
But it still leaves huge questions that are unanswered. Some of the big questions are, why does culture change? How does it change? Understanding the political economy of culture beliefs. There's a, uh, it's important to understand who's helped and who's hurt by holding beliefs. Is there a role of po for policy? That's something that economists like to think about a lot, and it's hard to think about it when it comes to culture because we tend to treat it as a primitive. By a primitive, we mean a fundamental, something that doesn't change. And of course, it's important to understand the interplay between culture, economic incentives, and institutions. Uh, the work that I've tried to show you very briefly today has really touched about second generation immigrants into the United States in the 1970s. Those faced a different set of challenges than second generation today. And I just hope that maybe some of the ideas that I put forward might help people think about those issues in a setting that's more relevant for today's second generation. Thank you. Um, so we've just heard three um, really great uh, uh, talks on the second generation, um, uh, the children of immigrants, excuse me. Um, so Roberto started us off by talking about um, uh, the way in which legal status is a master status for um, the children of immigrants um, and how they transition to illegality um, as, as they enter adulthood. Um, Flor then um, it kind of t turned, uh, asked us to look at uh, Haitian Americans in particular, um, and I think really pointed out in, in, in the examples that it's important to look at, um, uh, also pay attention to successful pathways um, and uh, leaders um, among the second generation. And, um, and Raquel uh, closed the panel by asking us to think uh, carefully about the role of culture and how, and, and, and really think about how to. Um, uh, use culture in our uh, explanations for what's going on. So um, I thought I would start out the my question disappeared. Thought I would uh, start the panel out by asking a question. Uh, start out by asking the panel a question, and then I'll turn it over to the floor. Um, and and I wanted to ask this as we sort of um, uh, as the conference comes to a close. Um, uh, Roberto brought up this notion of the, the master status, which of course comes from um, um, race um, being uh, a master status for African Americans, certainly, especially uh, uh, 50 years ago. Um, and then there's always a question of the degree to which it is now. Um, and is gender a master status for um, the children of immigrants um, in the United States? Um, and, and then to just draw on Raquel's work, to what extent is uh, uh, gender and gender roles and, and gender understandings of, of gender um, in sending countries and in the United States, to what extent do those influence um, the degree to which gender really plays this um, uh, uh, significant role um, beyond other kinds of identities, class, race, etc.? So I'm going to open that up to whoever wants to answer that question, and then we'll open it up to the floor. No, no. Okay. Or we can move on. <laughs> Okay. Let me attempt to answer that. Um, with regard to immigrants from third world countries, I have found out, uh, not only with the Haitian communities, but other communities, uh, women can easier, can find work easier. They work at domest as domestics, nannies in the service industries. So the women, in many cases, become the one who are breadwinners, while the husband try to find employment wherever. But the woman, for some reason, and I can talk about Haitian women, that's the first thing they do. They are able to work as domestic and as nannies. So they provide for the families while the husband try to find work. Now, that brings about problem because once the woman start working, in many ways the husband can't find himself diminish. That's another problem that that changing of role, the dislocation of traditional role plays now in the recipient country. So I'll leave it at that and we can go deeper into this. But. I can say that it's a it's a really good question. I, I don't know that I'll I'll answer your question directly, if at all. But I, I I think that I mean gender is certainly influenced by economics, by law, and by culture. And I think that the decisions that that families make 
for their second generation children, 1.5 and second generation are, are, are really shaped and constrained by, by all of these, these things. Um, so I'm gonna open it up to the conference participants if anyone has a question or comment. Um, I wanted to, to ask Raquel particularly, um, or, or address this directly. I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know if it's a question. If you can just introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Marcia Freeman. I was just, <laughs> yeah, from yes, the University well. of Minnesota, I was just up there two <laughs> hours ago. Um, <laughs> um, the, uh, you raised the issue of culture as something that may or may not be measurable, it seems. That's in, coming from where I come from. Um, one of the, I don't know if you're aware of this, and I wonder if we could find some way to have a conversation about it. One of the key issues in, in gender issues globally now is the question of the role of culture, which has been taken up in a huge way in a whole, in a number of spaces, um, inclu including within the human rights system. And we all understand, I think, how contested it is. And I'd like to know if you, you know, if you have any metric that you're working on that would, in some way, give us something measurable about the elements of culture. Because right now we have a lot of words, and I don't know if anything is measurable other than to say you you regress it out and you have culture as this thing that that influences things. Um, but right now we really are looking at how cultures change and the role of women in changing it and in participating in it to change it and claiming it. And I wonder if there's some way of connecting that. So it, it's not, I don't think it's measurable in that sense that you would say, well, um, this is culture. But what you do, what you try to do is to find a variable that in and of itself also captures culture. And then it's easier to study when you're studying variation in something. So you're looking across, say, why women do different things. And when something that measures culture among other things, so how much, say, women work elsewhere, okay? When that is able to help to explain something, I'm, I'm trying to explain a regression, so it's really hard. Uh, when that's able to explain some of the variation, then you're able to make quantitative statements like saying, well, if you, you know this variable, which helps to explain, embodies culture, when you move that around this so and you know such and such a, an amount, we expect to see such and such a, uh, an influence on how much women say work in the United States. But I think that, uh, I, I agree with you that uh, thinking about culture has become a big challenge. The whole, uh, there was uh, the World Bank, uh, the World Development Report from 2012 is all about gender. Uh, and the UN also, was, uh, the UN had also just recently put up a whole study on gender. And having participated in that, a lot of the discussion was to, well, how can we talk about this in a significant way? And how can we think about culture changing? And uh, I think that in development economics, there have been uh, quite a few examples, almost accidentally sometimes, of how we find that culture changes. For example, there was a study that used variation, I think, in, in Brazil, in the, where radio antennas had been placed, or television antennas had been placed. And it was kind of accidental variation in where they had been placed. And what they found is that, of course, people were watching TV, in these places, and the TV was showing a lot of you know, soap operas with smaller families. They found that people who had the exposure to these programs ended up having smaller families themselves, as that was seen as something desirable. So it wasn't that this was some sort of nefarious plan by the CIA to make people in third world countries have you know, smaller families. It wasn't that type of thing going on, but it was really just the fact that actually people respond, and they respond to what's seen sometimes as just desirable. So portraying the smaller families as desirable had a big influence. That might be one way. I hope you don't mind if I take one more minute and just say another study that was very interesting was an affirmative action plan that was put in place in, I want to say, India now. I'm going to blank out on the details. But what it, it was affirmative action in that uh, you, know, you had to elect a woman as a village council leader. And these, there was quotas in place. And what they found was that um, there, was different, there was these different neighborhoods that had these different quotas. And as, as the quotas were removed, because they were rotated through different neighborhoods, 
they found there was change in attitudes in a measurable way, not just the way that people would respond to surveys, but the propensity with which they now elected village women leaders. So having put something in place that, you know, people might debate about whether it's the right thing or wrong thing to do, which is something like a quota for political representation for women, ended up changing the local culture, the way that women were seen, and that once the quota was removed, they became much more favorable themselves. So, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Andres del Castillo. I'm a local Boston and Greater Boston community organizer. Um, and I'm also a US born child to an undocumented family. And so, listening to you speak about the success of the second generation uh, predicting kind of the outcome of what particular migrant population we're talking about, and also looking at as, as many numbers as we were able to see thrown up there and graphs, uh, one of the conversations some of us were having during the lunch break uh, portion of today was. Uh, talking about the, the complexities of using numbers and statistics to kind of try to drive policy changes because they at times can oversimplify the realities of our communities and what the policy suggestions are that come forward. Uh, as well as also, I was looking at the slide that was uh, put up earlier and putting up uh, different countries of ancestry can lead to difference in cultural beliefs, but also different countries of ancestry can lead to different traumatic experiences. Uh, because many times in causes of migration come through traumatic political experiences or traumatic social ex uh, experiences. And how that doesn't just stop in the first generation, but how trauma actually is, goes across generations and is carried on through the children. I wanted to know if you had any comments on that. Well, what I would, would say to this is, you know, in addition to the numbers, but also, also the importance of actually listening to the stories of those immigrants. And I think I'll go back to Sonia, listening to the stories and people who do you know, ethnographic work, anthropological work, actually go lived in those communities and see how everyday folks live, I think that can paint a picture that sometimes that may not be uh, recorded, you know, as you said, sometime in statistics. So to me, you know, while doing, you know, statistic, which is very important, but I think you really need to go out there in the communities, in the trenches, and listen to the stories as those people relate the story to you. And then your role to be to give a voice to those various people who otherwise would not have voices themselves to raise their particular needs, concern, and need, and uh, perspective. So that's kind of what I would say. Well, I'm Jose Luis, and I shared a little bit about my story earlier. But I think that, Sorry, you know. Just, uh, introduce yourself. Sorry. Yeah, I'm Jose Luis Elaya. I used to be homeless. Now I'm a 4.0 graduate student at Texas A&M. I'm undocumented. But my story is beyond my own story. Like, my story is my mom's story, and my mom's story is her mom's story, and so on and so on. And I think that, you know, as you know, my friend was talking about, we're all dreamers. There's dreamers here. So if you want to know what it is to be undocumented, talk to us. We'll tell you about my mom. I, I want to be able to tell you how my mom can't get out of her bed because she works so hard breaking Chirag wall so that I can have a book. And we can talk about those things. And I think that the, psycho the psychology of undocumented family is so big. In Texas, we had a student who actually is no longer with us. He's looking at, at us from above because being undocumented was so tough. So he, he just couldn't be here no more, so he took his life because of being undocumented. So being undocumented is a very serious issue. I had to go through counseling so many times, but I guess, I guess if y'all wanna hear about what it is to be undocumented from a personal perspective, you know, Ms. Sonia did a great job you know, by sharing our stories, but we are here, we wanna be able to talk about this. But my question is this, what advice do y'all have that y'all do like research and y'all do like amazing work and y'all very intellectual what advice do y'all have for us? How do we deal with the psychology of being undocumented and being rejected, but yet being told that we're from here? So this is a good question. This is a really, really important question. Um, and I, I, I want to say again that I, I, I really appreciate you sharing your story, and I really appreciate you all coming uh, this far from Texas. Um, so what I want to say, I think that the, what you say very powerfully really captures what is real. Um, and I think that, so 
the debate about undocumented students, undocumented young people, um, largely around the DREAM Act, has been framed very narrowly as an educational issue. Um, and I think that it makes sense for a lot of political reasons. And it makes sense on kind of a, a big kind of policy level, right? And so the narrative has been that undocumented young people like you, through no fault of your own, um, have trouble getting financial aid for college and will have trouble getting jobs. All of those are really, really important issues. Those are two really big fundamental issues. But that very narrow story leaves out a lot of the kind of everyday experience that you're describing, right? Is that being undocumented also means living in poverty, it means living in fear, it means being stressed out all the time. Um, when I started my research in California, I set out, I designed a, a questionnaire I mean, based on uh, a few sociological concepts and questions that I had around education, around work, around civic participation. And one thing that I found that I didn't expect was almost to the person is that those that I interviewed described physical or mental manifestations of stress. So headaches, chronic headaches, chronic toothaches, ulcers, trouble sleeping, trouble getting out of bed, eating problems, right? Thoughts of suicide, attempted suicide. This is all very real, right? And I don't have to tell you all, and I think that you all can really kind of amplify these stories, but why I think that this is, this is important, and I think that there's a, a particular script that's been really, really helpful to move policy along. But the DREAM Act was introduced in 2001 originally. This is 12 years later. And for you all, on a day-to-day -day basis, you have to kind of take care of your own everyday lives. And so how do we talk to social workers? How do we talk to school teachers? How do we talk to community officials? I, about kind of everyday needs. So how do we keep the, the big picture in mind but also look at kind of day-to-day -day realities? Thank you. My name is Berenice Hernandez and I'm a Texas A&M student. And I just have a comment to say that thank you for having this conference. I know it's uniting us to find a solution to this problem. And I would just wanna say that every person that is here, um, you are able to help us. You, you can do something for a child that, you know, it's an immigrant that he may be facing a lot of obstacles. So don't just think, I mean, take this from the, the conference that you are able to help, you are able to join our voice in this movement. And um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Hi, uh, my name is Alan, and uh, I'm a community organizer in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, and I just had uh, to raise a concern and pose a question. Um, so this is a border crossing and um, gender conference. Um, and I see that there's a lot of visibility that's lacking, especially um, on the queer, undocumented community. Um, because a lot of our queer, undocumented folk, um, they go through this um, chronic stress that you just um, briefly touched about, and they are forced to inhibit a double closet as it regards to their sexual orientation and their legal status. And the fact that there's no visibility raised on it further perpetuates this notion of our um, undocumented queer folk dying in the closet um, because there's not a space in society because when someone's undocumented and queer, the idea of safe spaces are completely eroded and only safe solutions can be made. And I think that's it's something that we really need to consider um, in, you know, in further discourse when we talk about how gender and border crossing uh, mix. And I wanted to see if you had any comments on what you thought about um, the idea of having an identity that's queer and a status that's undocumented, because undocumented is not a status, it's something a person temporarily is. And there's definitely, um, and I'm here testifying as a researcher and a student who um, happens to be undocumented, but who is queer. And that's something that I really wanna, um, you know, dig a little deeper and take a step back and really analyze that and develop something critical um, and step into that reality. And I wanted to see if you had anything to say about that. So I think that's really, really powerful. I, I, I think that in my sample, there are probably a good, probably 20 or more undocu queer young adults. And I think that certainly this social movement of undocumented young people coming out as undocumented, unafraid, unapologetic um, 
has been really impressive over the last several years and has really, really picked up pace. And I think that a, a good reason why the DREAM Act came up for a vote a couple of years ago because, was because of the real energy of students. Um, and I think that very importantly, that what a lot of the students have, have really taught us, and I, I talked about this kind of narrow frame, and part of that narrow frame also includes the kind of straight A student, um, the straight A student dreamer. And the reality is that not everybody is that. But I think that the, what a lot of undocumented young, people, young organizers have done really is to articulate multiple frames, and I think multiple identities, and multiple points of intersectionality. I think that if we look across the, across the country, a lot of the leaders in this movement are undocu-queer. Um, and I, 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 I think that I can't say anything else but really appreciate you bringing that to the fore. Hi, my name is Samuel Choi. I work at the Massachusetts Office for Refugees and Immigrants. I have a question specifically about language development and cultural identity. Um, I was really encouraged about the example about the second generation Haitian Americans who are successful, who have made great strides, but they don't leave it there, and they decide to go back and give back to their motherland. And I was thinking about the word motherland, how gendered that is. And, and I want to kind of tie into what uh, Roberto has, has brought uh, out, which is the um, pattern of second generation or 1.5 generation kids who are accumulating American experiences, but at the same time, um, not being able to connect with their parents' culture. Um, and I was wondering if you can speak to the um, differences between different ethnic cultures and why is the Haitian American experience so strong in making sure the children inherit that sense of pride and also language in terms of knowing Haitian Creole and being bilingual. So how can we foster bilingual fluency in general in our schools, um, in our communities? Are these processes gendered uh, when it comes to family decisions? You know, is it, uh, in other words, are mothers or fathers expected to be the ones who make sure their kids inherit their culture or their language? Um, and then lastly, I wanted to kind of ask a broader question about economic measurements about bilingualism. A lot of times we know basically that adult immigrants who learn English, there's a very, very direct link to rise in wages. But for second generation immigrants, are there economic measurements that show bilingualism as an economic advantage when it comes to job opportunities, um, globalization, and just the idea of um, us being a more transnational world where people can make contributions across borders um, with someone who is bilingual or bicultural being at the center of, of that um, dynamic and being cultural broker, brokers and being those transnational links. I'm going to attempt to answer the part about the transmission of the cultural heritage, the ancestral heritage. Uh, in many immigrant communities, the business of raising children is not solely left to the mother or the father, what we call the nuclear family. The extended family plays a very, very important role. So the minute you have an aunt, a grandmother, a godmother, and everything else, and the, the grandmother or grandfather, they, do not, they do not speak any other language in the case of the Haitian community, Haitian Creole. De facto, the children know that language, and that's the only language they have to communicate with uh, the older generation. So to me, that's very important. The composition of the family who is there uh, all the time with the children. Uh, another factor is also residential space. The larger the community, the, they stick together. If, for example, here when I was doing field work uh, years ago in the Haitian community, and I'm not from Boston, I would ask, you know, key people that I knew from Boston, I went to find Haitian. Where do I go to find them? They would tell me Matapen. They would tell me Dorchester. And again, that shows the residential space plays a factor. 
because if you are a child living in that environment, you hear it in the neighborhood. So the strength of the neighborhood, the various things that the neighborhood has, restaurant, shops, community centers, and whatnot, churches, let's not forget the churches, you know, all of that are important element in the transmission of the Haitian culture, of the Haitian or ethnic culture, as well as language. To me, that's very important. And uh, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll let all the person on that. Just two comments on that. One is uh, uh, when I was studying female labor force participation, how much women work, and the transmission of culture, uh, one of the things we, uh, we looked at was the propensity of different groups to live in neighborhoods that had a lot of other people who were similar to them, you know, who were from the same ancestral background, same country of exit. And the great, we found that culture had a greater force, pretty obviously, but still, you could show this, the, the, for those groups that lived in neighborhoods that had a lot of people from their own group. So, for example, the French tend not to live with other French people. The Mexicans tend to live with other Mexicans, and you saw a much greater uh, power of the cultural variable in explaining differences across groups for those, for those. And then the other was just a more personal note, which is, you know, I was raised in this country, I was born in this country, and we spoke Spanish at home. Of course, my English at this point is better than uh, my Spanish, but nonetheless, with my daughter, I speak Spanish at home. And I think a lot of it is, uh, you know, it's just sheer determination that you want to pass something on. And I don't think, you know, I think it's hard to think about something that's more emotional uh, than language, and you try to pass on your language. Okay. Um, I'm going to take the chair's privilege and ask a question to, to um, Actually, to Raquel. Um, so I, I'm going to incorporate a, a question that I received from from the floor. And this person asked um, about uh, solutions or programs to sort of address some of the problems that have come up in this panel and in previous panels. Um, and um, Raquel, you're an economist, and I know that the inter if we think about social policy around immigration, that the, the policymakers often listen to economists. Um, so how? And you're thinking about culture and and how to sort of uh, think about culture in, in, in economic terms. So how would you sort of take some of the things that Roberto and Flora have been talking about um, and translate that into a sort of policy kind of language or um, say an economic framework? Or I mean, how do you think about that? Natasha, that is a very uh, unfair question. <laughs> so I mean, I think that you one thing pass. that has been missing from this conference um, you know, that would be nice to do a whole other conference on might be, you know, what the cor correct policy response might be or for whom and for what and the pros and cons of different policies. But I really think that's a big one for me to bite off just because I'm an economist. And uh, I'm going to say that that's something I would love to hear from other people who thought better and harder than I have about that question. So in the interest of time, we're going to have, um, uh, everyone ask their question and then we'll turn it over to the floor to speak to all of them or um, as much as they can. So go ahead. Hi, my name is Cristina Fletes. I'm a concurrent degree student at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and Berkeley Law. I also grew up in a mixed status household. That means I was the first person in my family to be born in this country. But my parents and sister were undocumented for the first 13 years that they were here in this country. Uh, my question is for Ms. Fernandez. Um, as I listened to your presentation, I felt a little bit concerned about the methodology for two points. The first one is the relevance of something that worked in the 1970s to something today. For example, you said for second generation people, their economic institutional environments is now the same. I don't think that's true today. So my fear is that a researcher here might think that they can apply something that worked in the 1970s to today when it's not the case. The second one is, I know you're controlling for variables such as education, spouse's age, education, and income, but I still believe there's an omitted variable bias in the study, which is the culture of xenophobia, racism in this country against people from different national origins, and I don't see that being controlled for in the study. So my fear is that using this methodology will lead to cultural reductionist arguments. 
Yeah. Okay, so, so I think we'll just in the interest of time, we'll, we'll take okay. all of them and then everyone can, have, we'll, we'll go through the panel. Well, I have a question to comment. My name is Irlene Francois and I, um, my family immigrated to Cambridge, Massachusetts specifically so we could all go to Harvard. So they had, they had a goal in mind. And I am so happy to see you, uh, Professor Flor Zephyr, uh, because before you came, I came with a friend of mine and I kept asking, where is the Asian community? Boston is the third largest Haitian community in the country. You go outside of this building and the line of taxi cabs, they're all Haitians. When I signed up, the woman at the desk said, Francois, we have someone working here. And I walk in here and until you came, Haiti was only mentioned once. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation. But I also have a question. You mentioned about the second generation successful Haitian Americans. Um, is there a gap, is there uh, a gendered gap in terms of the Haitian uh, American women of the second generation succeed as a higher success, uh, success rate, uh, particularly material success, intellectual success rate, than the men do? Is there one or is it equal? You mentioned you, uh, you had Wyclef Jean, Michel de Graff, and then uh, Edwidge Dantica. So I, I was just, I just wondered about that, if you could answer to that. That's my question. Thank you. I will, I will talk, yeah, talk yeah, first. Yes. Hello, my name is Lisa Antaby. I'm a researcher at the French uh, National Research Center in France, the CNRS at the University of Aix-en-Provence near Marseille. Uh, and I've been working since the 90s with uh, Ethiopian Jews in Israel and currently with uh, Eritrean and Sudanese asylum seekers in Israel, who are about 60,000 today. Uh, I had one question for Roberto Gonzalez. I was very surprised that you said um, the children did not realize they were illegal. And I was wondering what are the experiences of children as illegal because in some of my research, very young children know very quickly that they should fear the police. They have family members deported. I mean, illegality is one of their experiences. So I was interested to know um, how come <laughs> they awaken at 18 to this. And to Flor uh, Zephyr, I was wondering about the role of language um, uh, and how French might also be uh, in these status distinctions you made between the families from middle class uh, background and the lower income. And if the use of French here is also a strategy to identify or not with uh, a higher status group or not, and if there are any identification patterns with some of the francophone um, African migrants in Israel, and maybe di in, in America, sorry, and the distancing with the uh, American black, uh, black Americans in, in, in the States. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to, those were three really rich questions. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists, if you'll bear with me, to um, just say one comment about one of the questions, and just because we're out of time. Um, apologies for that. I, I think reductionism, a little bit of reductionism is a good thing, but I take, I take seriously who, your, your concerns, um, certainly, especially when you're thinking about more current. But this is, if, you know, if we had had time, I would explain better, I hope, why this is a weak way to think about test for culture. In other words, there's many reasons it can fail. There can be racism, there can be a lot of reasons that this might fail. There's a, so it's kind of like great when it works. It's not guaranteed to work. And if it doesn't work, you, can, you can't say, well, you know, that, that means that culture doesn't matter to these decisions. But the type of things that I'm looking at, which would be, say, the differences in the work of women of Swedish descent versus, say, women of Italian descent, I mean, there might be a bit of discrimination going on in the 1970s about this, but not necessarily. And when I look at these women's wages, so that's a big deal, there isn't any of that. In other words, I don't find differences in, in their wages able to explain what they do. So there's a lot of creative ways that you can approach these type of problems, and I think that's part of the excitement of being a researcher, is that you try to think about ways in which you would deal with this. Thanks. Laura. To respond to the question that you asked, Madame Francois, uh, I am not taking credit for being here at Harvard University. 
credit goes to the Ratcliffe Institute of Advanced Studies and Mary Waters, who thought that it would be beneficial in the city of Boston, the state of Massachusetts, to include Haitian immigrants in their conversation. So the credit goes to you, not to me. <laughs> okay, now with regard to the second question, what role does uh, the language play in the social class of Haitian? Of course, language uh, plays a role, and particularly the French language. In Haiti, we do have two languages, two languages recognized by the Constitution as being national languages, but certainly there is no Haitian in Haiti or abroad who would tell you that the two languages are on a par. To use a word used by linguists, they talk about the two languages being in a diglossic situation where one is considered the higher language and the other uh, considered the low language, although there have been efforts to move Haitian Creole on a par to French. To what extent that is the reality is an, another topic of debate. So Haitian immigrants were bilingual. Bilingual meaning uh, since Haiti, they were raised speaking both French and Creole. When they come to the US, they seek membership into other communities because they don't want to be perceived as black American. That is a negative term given the images portrayed rightly or wrongly, more, mostly wrongly, about some African Americans, some you know, from the lower socioeconomic status. So therefore, some Haitian bilingual would seek membership, and I had written to that topic, uh, about that topic as well elsewhere, about their membership in a greater francophone community. Because for them, it is better to be considered you know, part of the francophone d'Amérique as opposed to part of the minorities of America. So some play on their bilingual heritage French you know, to seek membership into something in their mind is a bit more desirable than the label minorities that are placed left and right on third world immigrant. And I don't need to go into what that means. For example, for uh, Haitian, so oh, that, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I, I get we, carried away. Thank Roberto, you for reminding me. Yes, you did say success. Last comment. <laughs> sorry, Roberto. <laughs> getting carried away. Um, so Natasha asked an uh, important question about policy. And one of the Texas students brought up the very important issue of the students telling their own stories. Um, and so my response to, I, I think, both of these things is that I think that it's critically important that students are telling their own, own stories and that, that, pe that people are telling their own stories. I also think that par partnership between researchers and community members is critically important. And there's something about having system, bringing systematic evidence to bear on policy and practice debates. And just two very quick examples. Um, I, I currently live and teach in Chicago. Um, and Illinois last year passed the Illinois Dream Act. And part of the Illinois, part of the requirements of the Illinois Dream Act um, is that every counselor, every school counselor in the state of Illinois needs to have training on kind of the circumstances of undocumented students, but also um, what, uh, what's available for them. And so I'm very proud that this research that I've been carrying out over the last 10 years and really an involvement with the community over the last 20 years has been able to importantly inform um, those trainings. Um, yeah, I, I'll give, I, I could give another few examples, but we're very, very late on time. So um, please join me in thanking um, the wonderful panelists and for all of your uh, comments. <laughs>